The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. The title of the message this morning is the third level of the cross. In the past weeks, we've talked about the first two levels, um, but not extensively about the third level. So I'll do a brief review and then talk about the third level. Now I'm saying the levels of the cross, the work of the cross has, it seems, been almost forgotten, especially in America. Um, I read in uh, one of John Sanford's books many years ago about a stronghold of carnal theology that rests upon America where during the early 1900s some theological um, doctrines were adopted and propagated that left out the work of the cross. And when I got saved uh, 30 years ago, I hadn't gone to a Bible-believing church. I'd gone to a pretty dead denominational church. And the things that I had been taught in Sunday school, I now understood, did not line up with what the Bible taught. So I wanted a church that believed the Bible, the Bible so I started studying churches and looking for a local church. But before that, I read the Bible and I read the book of Acts. Just, and I said, this is, what, this is what our church fellowships are supposed to be like. This is what our church meetings are supposed to be like. And then I started going to church. And things didn't add up. There was something really wrong. And back then, you didn't dare breathe this. Whatever these people who speak in tongues got, it doesn't look, their lives don't look like the book of Acts. They gossip, they sin. The young people, the first fellowship that I went to, I took my unsaved son who was 12 years old at that time, had never been churched. And one day coming home from church, he said, Mother, the kids raise their hands and act like they're worshiping God in the service, but then as soon as they leave the church, they act like everybody else. He's still not saved. You know what that does to a mother's heart? So, with my way of thinking, I started reading, and I started studying, and I started learning what is available to us in God just through the work of the cross, not sovereign things that the Lord would pour out at certain times, but just through the work of the cross and started studying about who teaches the work of the cross and found out that there are several denominations, not many, but several in America that teach the work of the cross, but that we have reached a time where they're lamenting that they teach the doctrine, but they've lost the experience. And so in all my studying over the years and reading the lives of the mystics, the great saints, the martyrs, uh, the people who had rich experiences in God, I learned a lot. But it has really only been since the Lord moved, but I didn't have the experience. The Lord moved, brought Jason into an experience through a work of the cross, and it ignited something in here. And I'll go into that later, but there are three great levels of the cross, three great demarcations in our spiritual lives. In each one, there's an entrance to the experience as an encounter, but then there's a process of walking it out, and you can stop at any level. And so then there's another entrance and a walking it out at another entrance and walking it out. John Wesley's one of my heroes. He is a 
picture of what an apostolic father can do in a nation. He brought the Methodists, they weren't called the Methodists at that time, but he brought the Methodists into the second level of the work of the cross that we're calling the replaced life. And it completely changed a nation. It was said that in the 1800s that it was hard to believe that England had ever been a Christian nation because they, the people were so wicked and the vices of debauchery were so awful. They didn't have any of the seven mountains. They didn't have government. They didn't have media. They didn't have entertainment. They sure didn't have the church. They even kicked John Wesley out of the church. So he went out and his, the fields became his, um, his pulpit and his platform, and people would climb into trees to listen to him preach. And the Lord opened a bigger platform to him than if he had been inside of one of the churches preaching. But he taught the second level of the cross, and it changed a whole nation. The people... He, he went, he reached the dregs of society. He went to the prisons. He went to the workhouses, the poorest of the poor. And he trained and he taught them how to walk in this level in Christ, in Messiah. And it transformed a nation in his lifetime. All seven mountains were taken by God. So it can happen. All seven mountains of society were taken by God. I'd like to read to you a quote by John Wesley. Give me a hundred believers who hate nothing but sin and love God with all their hearts, and I will shake the world for Jesus. One hundred, and I will shake the world. I'd say that's about how many, maybe a few more than that, that we have in here this morning. That's really saying something, isn't it? Last summer, I was crying out to God in my heart mostly in our prayer time. And I was looking around at the wickedness in the world. I was looking at, at ISIS, the things that are going on, the terrorism, the, um, the stranglehold that the fake news media has um, on people. Just... The darkness, the darkness, the darkness. Oh, all the different perversions that are going on that I don't think the founders of this nation would believe that was taking place here. I would think it would be, they would think it was a lie, all that's going on. Um, and so I started crying out, there's got to be a people like John Wesley spoke of. There have to be people who surrender so much to God that He can work fully through them. Because what God needs now, only God can do. And God can work only through completely surrendered people. That's why He limited, him, he limited Himself to our prayers and our surrender to Him to get things done on the earth. And, you know, in the great prayer, if my people will humble themselves and pray, it, the burden rests on us to get serious with God. So I was crying out in my heart because I knew of the level of the overcomers is the highest level of the cross. Those whose lives are completely abandoned for God so that He can live through them as fully as he lived his life through Jesus the Savior during his earth walk. That was the Father living through Jesus. In John 14, Jesus said, It's the Father in me who does the works. It's the Father who gave him the words to say. It's the Father as the authority that Jesus obeyed at every moment. Jesus never went rogue. Jesus never had a better idea. Jesus never got out from his father's authority. And so I was crying in my heart as David cried when Goliath was challenging the army of God in Israel. 
And he said, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? And that was my heart's cry to God. Is there not a cause? Lord, I present my body a living sacrifice. I want you to live that completely through me. This is what I want. I want to surrender my life totally to you. And I spent the summer with, the God, with God opening the scriptures to me and feeling overshadowed or hovered over by the Holy Spirit. And I believe the Lord is really starting to move on us in this congregation. So I'm going to go back now after that, and I'm going to give you a little theology. I'm going to explain a little bit more about the levels, give a review of the second level, the replaced life, and talk about the third level. When Jesus was on earth, he was the perfect expression of his Father. Am I right? Yes. As a matter of fact, when the disciples were in the room after um, when Jesus was speaking to them, and Philip said, we'll be happy if you just show us the Father. I guess thinking he would open up and let them see into the heavenly realm or something. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In Jesus, we saw the love of God, God's heart expressed. We saw God's holiness expressed. We saw God's compassion expressed. And we saw God's severity expressed. You have made my house a den of thieves. And he threw the tables and the money away. Crashing down the severity of God. It's interesting that the severity of God was displayed in the temple, not in the world. Said Jesus came to call sinners to repentance, but the, the Pharisees and the ones who are self-righteous, Jesus said, woe to those. They think they have it all together and they have nothing. They search the scriptures thinking that in the scriptures they'll find me, the word, the word they'll find me, but then they won't come to me standing right here with them so they can truly have life. The dead letter. The central mystery in all of Christianity is union with God. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. He who is one with the Lord, is joined to the Lord, is one spirit with him. However, Jesus came as the captain of our salvation, not as the only begotten son that the Father sent to earth, but after his ascension, he became the firstborn of many sons. And what kind of sons are those? Hebrews 2.10 say their sons restored to the glory of the Father. He came as the captain of our salvation to bring many sons to that level so that they too would walk, love, and express the Father just as Jesus did. We are created in the image of God to be expressions of God just like Jesus. And the great secret is that the three levels of the cross restore us to three great levels of union with God, with the third level being the greatest restoration. God's eternal purpose that we find in the book of Ephesians speaks of God's will being his pleasure, his joy, his joy. God's eternal purpose has joy in it. Moreover, it says in Ephesians that there's a counsel of God's will, that the Godhead got together in eternity past and they discussed the plan to restore humanity back to its proper place in God's order. 
And it tells us in Ephesians that before the New Testament was written, before the ascension, before Pentecost, it was a mystery. It had not been fully revealed. But now in the New Testament, this is the primary theme that, tie, that ties the entire New Testament together. God willed or purposed to make known what are the riches of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Messiah in you, the hope or confident expectation of being restored to God's glory. God has an inheritance. Now, we know that we're heirs with Jesus, joint heirs with him, right? That we have an inheritance in Jesus. But God has an inheritance too. He has a purpose, and his purpose will be fulfilled. And that inheritance is sons of God, sons of God who will fully reveal Jesus to the world. In the book of Ephesians, there are two great apostolic prayers. One in the first chapter that says, Paul prayed for us. Prayed, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in knowing him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you might know what is the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. The inheritance of God. Hmm. So Paul prayed that we would understand it, that we would be, have a spirit of wisdom and revelation, and the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened to even see this. But then, Ephesians 3, 16 through 19, Paul prays for us again. He prays that we will experience the riches of that, the riches of that glory, that Christ may settle down and make his home in our hearts, that we, he, we would fully know the complete, other loving, self giving love of the God who does not love to get but lives to love. That that is his delight to pour out his love on us. But there's a purpose to that that he wants us to come into the richest possible experience of his son. You see, God doesn't give us things like, um, he doesn't give us a little bit of holiness. He doesn't give us a little bit of love, like, like a little gift package or a special uh, sovereign little poof outpouring. God gives us more of his son because God is love. Jesus is love. God is light. Jesus is light. God is glory. Jesus is glory. God is holy. Jesus is holy. Only Jesus can be holy in us. We can't do it. We can't live the Christian life. But as God gives us his son, and we experience through the work of the cross the fullness of him dwelling in us, it Christ in us, Jesus in us as us. It is not you who live but it's Jesus living in you. Nevertheless, I live, but I live now by faith in the Son of God. He does the living, and I do the resting. I can't live the Christian life. I can't be holy. I rest in Him and allow Him to be holiness in me. The inheritance of God. God wants sons. And there's a big difference between being a child of God and a son of God. There's a great demarcation that I may bring up a little bit later in the book of Romans. Now, you know when I speak of sons, that men are included in the bride and women are included as a son of God, right? 
a bride speaks of intimacy and mutual love and devotion. Sons accomplish a work on earth. So here you have intimacy and you have action. The Greek word for sons is weos, H-U-I-O-S, and it refers to one who has reached full maturity and is a worthy heir of the father. A son who's ready to take his place and be about his father's business. And again, I quote John Wesley, give me a hundred believers like that who hate nothing but sin and love God with all their heart and I will shake the world for Jesus. We have a world that needs a lot of shaking. And so Romans speaks of the entire created universe. Romans 8, 19, eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. We are that generation. We are the Joshua generation. We're the generation that's going, and for you older people, we are going to be the ones who will work with you younger people, the generation X's and, and Y's and Z's, the millennials. And God is going to bring together the generations. I love that song that we were talking about, that being throned upon the praises of a thousand generations because our generation will now be joining with the great cloud of witnesses to accomplish God's purpose on earth and shake the nations for Jesus. We're going to be an army of the Lord. We're going to be a Gideon's 300 who will be baptized into one organism. The Lord's already given us some experiences of new ways of praying in the heavenlies and partnering with Father God to bring down strongholds. Dennis had a vision one morning in our prayer time of seeing a slimy net of of a demonic agendas and, and ties and all sorts of things. And you know that those are principalities linking together and they link people together under these principalities that take people captive under corporate strongholds. And it, D, G, Dennis saw Jesus rise up like a mighty warrior and break through that net. We're going to see the strongholds broken over cities and nations. But God needs an army on earth to do that through. A unified army, a Gideon's 300. And I believe God is preparing us now, not only as sons, not only as the bride, but also as an army. He told us when we started this fellowship to create an upper room to birth a church. What does that make you think of? When was a church birthed? On Pentecost, when the wind of heaven was released upon a people, they became third-level believers who turned the world upside down because of the power and the glory that rested on their lives. A body connected with heaven itself. A body that made a portal or a conduit or a channel for heaven to be released on earth. The work of the cross and only the work of the cross makes it possible for us to be mature sons. You can move in mighty gifts of the Spirit. You can be a great prophetic speaker. You can have also great gifts of healings, but that doesn't mean that you've had a work of the cross. I would, gifts are great. Spiritual gifts, gifts are awesome. Prophecy, healing, words of knowledge, words of wisdom and all that. But God wants a company who's one with him in intimacy, one with his heart. And it says in the book of John chapter 14, Jesus says, it's the Father in me who does the works, but you're going to see greater works than these because I go to my Father. And if you read John 14, Jesus is telling them for the first time, revealing the mystery in John 14, that he is the spiritual way by which we come into the presence of the Father. He's not a way like just a salvation tract. You see, I will never be part, physically part of this pulpit. 
I can never be completely physically one with another person. It's just impossible. We live in a, a, a world of physical matter. However, spirits can come together. This is how husband and wife become one flesh and one spirit, a new creation. Because in a God-ordained marriage, a man and a woman come together and their spirits are joined by God. Now we know that on another level that people can be praying in an upper room and come into one accord in the spirit, not like husband and wife, but can be open and joined in one spirit in one accord, which is exceedingly pleasing to God. That in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, their unity, their one accordness reached critical mass and heaven opened. That's what we're doing here Sunday mornings. Have you noticed that the, it's, the presence of God is increasing during our worship? It's because our hearts are being knit closer and closer. So when we sing our songs, we're not just singing songs. We are agreeing with heaven and coming into one accord to, answer, to pray a corporate prayer in song to the Lord. And it says, when two or more are gathered or come into symphony, perfect harmony with my name, there I am in their midst and whatever they ask, I will do for them. So we're having a grand prayer meeting every Sunday morning where we're agreeing with heaven for that work here. Now, brief overview. Let me give you the three levels of the cross. The first level, and you might want to write some of this down. There should be some of these sheets in the back, <clears throat> excuse me, in the back so you can get one. The first level of the cross where the vast majority of believers are parked right now Forgiven by the blood of Jesus, they're forgiven. But they're trying to live the Christian life in their own strength. They know Jesus for me, Jesus is with me, Jesus helps my alleys, Jesus answers my prayers, Jesus helps me, Jesus is for me, but there's a perception of distance there. They know they're forgiven but they still are operating pretty much in self-love, what they need, what I want, and self-effort. You see, the work of Jesus on the cross provided two remedies for man's problems. In Adam, we inherited a wrong spirit, a sin spirit. He says that the prince of the power of the air rules the people of the earth, right? causing them to do what he wants even though they think they're doing what they want to do because we are simply containers. We were made in the image of God to have life only when we're filled with a spirit. And the scriptures tell us that the body without a spirit is dead. And we know when a person's spirit leaves the body, they're gone. The heart stops done, but they haven't disappeared, of course we know. So the first problem we have is we need forgiveness for our sins that are committed. And that's the easy one. And there's a cost. We have to count the cost on each level. Do you know there's some people who won't receive Jesus as their Savior because they don't want to stop doing their sins? And many other reasons why people count the cost for the forgiven life and assess it as too high. However, for those of us who want to be pleasing to God, when Jesus died, Scripture tells us we died. Guess what happens when you die? Your spirit leaves your body. That wrong spirit, that spirit of error, that spirit of disobedience, the spirit that worked in the sons of disobedience left us. You see, we don't get, we, we got all this at the moment of salvation, but who knows that it can take you a little while to figure out some of the things Jesus has given us so we can appropriate them. Because we have to first see 
and then we can appropriate. And what you can see, you can have. Okay, so when Jesus was raised from the dead, what happened with us? We were raised true too because all humanity went to the cross. That's the price Jesus paid. When he was raised, we were raised. When he ascended to sit at the right hand of the Father, we ascended into the heavenly realm, no longer bound by the ties to earth. The second level of seeing, and most people see this in three um, distinct levels. Oh, let me go back to this. In the first great awakening in America, many were swept into the kingdom of God in the forgiven level. The salvation experience became commonplace all across the colonies. It broke through denominational walls. It broke through uh, state governmental walls. It broke through ethnic walls. And it united the colonies in the common experience of one nation under God for the first time. Now, I know John Wesley lived during that time and he changed England during that time, but his message had the biggest impact when it was rediscovered during the Second Great Awakening. Charles Finney rediscovered what John Wesley taught and the holiness message, the second work of the cross, the replaced life, the message went all through the eastern part of the United States. Unfortunately, it didn't get so much carried to the Wild West. And this is where the stronghold of carnal theology uh, really began taking root in America. And the gospel was watered down to the lowest possible element of forgiven by the blood of Jesus. But then people d developed a false expectation that they would experienced it all. And then so many backslid because they found out, I can't live the Christian life in my own strength. So they either went into denial or back and became uh, pharisaical and legalistic in their efforts, or they gave up and backslid. A number of celebrities have been saved in, in our day, and it's broken my heart because I know that they're probably just given a gospel of the bare bones salvation message, and I see them backslide. And you know what that does as a witness of Jesus before the world? Because when you're a celebrity, everybody sees what's going on. And it's just very sad to me. Now, remember I said that we are just containers. We have a spirit, either a false deity or Jesus living in us. So what do we do? We recognize, we see it first. Remember, if you see it, you can have it. This is a work of the cross. This is not some special thing with those some have. This is not haves and have nots. This is for whosoever will. We don't have to wait around for um, be in the right place or the right conference for a, a sudden poof from God. Okay? Now, we are containers, created as containers. We can't live without containing something. And that something is a spirit. And so we have brochures or little pamphlets on the back, at the back on a chair, of entering in to the second level, telling Jesus basically, I see it now. I see it now. I receive by faith. And fortunately, we found out that the experience has been is impartable by laying on of hands. So I would say that maybe the majority of the people in our fellowship here have had the experience. So this is for you. This is for you. This is for every, and every child too who can understand it, who has enough functional language to understand it. This is for child and adult. And we have little pamphlets that tell, now that Jesus is living his holy life in me, what about the temptations and sins that try to pull me away from him? Because see, we're in union with him. 
that temptations happen outside of that union. So we yield to that union and it becomes easy to resist temptation. And if you give in, no condemnation, you receive forgiveness. And there is a longer, this is called daily life in the second level, temptation and sin. And we do have a little booklet, booklet that gives more information that's available on our website for $2 on how to do that. So the second level, the replaced life. Now remember I said that the message of the cross is the primary message of the entire New Testament. Certainly of the epistles. Romans gives us the big picture of what the cross delivers us from and delivers us into. Romans 1 through 5 is a salvation section. Justification, that's the word, the big Bible word for a salvation experience, justification. Romans 6 through chapter 8 verse 9 brings us into the replaced life. The Bible word for that is sanctification, which comes from the root word that means holiness. Who can be holy? Who's the only person who can be holy? Jesus. God the Father, Jesus. We can't be holy. Jesus has to live holiness in us in the replaced life. Romans gives us the big picture. Now from Romans 8, verse 9, through the end of the book, this is about living the enthroned life, the life connected with the one who's seated together with the Father of the heavenlies. So you get the big picture from man's perspective in the book of Romans. You get the big picture from God's perspective in the book of Ephesians. This is talking about God's eternal purpose for us, His longing, His desire for humanity, His desire to have sons. In Galatians, we learn that we are crucified and risen with Messiah. It says, I am crucified with Christ, with Jesus. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but He lives in me. Colossians speaks about being risen, living resurrection life through him. His resurrection life now is my resurrection life. 1 Thessalonians is all about resisting temptation in the replaced life. Resisting temptation. How do we live this out? How do we make it really work in daily life? Remember, to every level there's an entrance and then there is a process of walking it out because we grow in grace and in the knowledge of God. The book of Hebrews, this is a sad book to me. We have the Ephesians church that fully enters in. They present their bodies a living sacrifice to God. They, God, I am yours. Live through me. Accomplish what you need to accomplish on earth through me. Hebrews is Paul's exhortation to Enter the third level. <laughs> Those who have seen it, but they are reluctant, they are reluctant to enter into the experience. And remember, on every level there's a counting of the cost. If you don't want to be holy, if you don't want your life to be holy, why would you want Jesus to come in and the replace life and live holiness through you? If you just wanted to be a little bit saved and have fire insurance. You wouldn't want that. But I think we're made of better stuff in this place. Paul tells them, you have access to the throne of grace. You have access to throne life in the heavenly realm where you can partner with the Father. When by this time you should be teachers. But you're like babies. You can't even take strong meat. You have to have milk. What's the matter with you people? You've seen what's available for you. And then he says, you're just like the Israelites in the wilderness and you know what happened to them. You've, if you refuse this, you've trodden underfoot the blood of Jesus. 
He has some pretty strong things to say. But Jesus presents himself in this book as Melchizedek, the king of peace, the one that had no beginning and no end. And we enter into what the Old Testament calls the Zadok priesthood and the New Testament calls the order of Melchizedek. Throne life people, sons of God. First John explains to us the love of the enthroned life. This is what God being love in us looks like. Philippians is the joy of the enthroned life. That's the fullness of joy level, people. This is really good stuff. The joy of the enthroned life. Let's see, I think I have some scriptures on that. Yes, I do. A little bit over. It says, John says to us, John 15, Jesus says to us, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and your joy may be full. So there's a fullness of joy. There is a fullness of joy. And John says that this fellowship in John, um, 1 John 1 through 3, verses 1 through 3, John says, this fellowship that we once knew when Jesus walked the earth, where we touched his hands, where we could see him and know that he was right there with us. We're still having that same fellowship, and we encourage you to enter into that too, so where he is you may be also, that our joy may be full. There's a joy in fellowship when we're one, when we're in one accord with other fellow believers, and we're in union with the Lord, that there is a joy that is indescribable, indescribable and full of glory. And this joy is reserved for those who come to the third level, the enthroned life. And we're told in the messages to the overcomers, who are the sons of God, in um, the book of Revelation, that there is laid up for them hidden manna, that there was the manna that all Israel ate, but there was manna that was placed in a golden pot in the Ark of the Covenant in itself. You have to get pretty close to God now to have that access to that manna. Heavenly manna. Heavenly food, a heavenly banquet. Do you remember the story of John when um, Jesus stopped and sat on the edge of a well and was talking with a Samaritan woman? And it said he was wearied by the journey. Of course, he had been led by the Spirit to go there, just as the book of Romans says that the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. It doesn't mean like a casual stroll. It means they are compelled by the Spirit compelled by the Spirit to go there, just as Jesus was compelled by the Spirit to go into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And so his disciples went to buy some food and came back, and he was talking to this Samaritan woman. And usually Israelites went, the Jews went completely out of their way to go around Samaria because they, they considered them outcasts, just the lowest of the low, pretty close to the dregs. Um, they didn't want to see them. They didn't want to talk to them. They didn't want to touch them. And so Jesus is sitting there talking to this woman when the disciples come back. And at this point, she realizes she's met the, the Messiah. And she has run back to tell the city what she has found. And so all of a sudden... Jesus tells his disciples he doesn't need food, that he has food to eat that they know, uh, know, know not of. 
And this woman comes back with a multitude well, right before they came into view. Now, the Samaritan workers would wear all white in the fields. And Jesus talks about the fields being white unto harvest. And all of a sudden, all these people dressed in white come running to see this Messiah. And a revival breaks out, and Jesus stayed two more days fully, fully refreshed and energized by this spiritual food because all of a sudden the kingdom of God had opened up to a group of people who had been outcasts from Israel. There is spiritual food and joy indescribable available for those of us who count the cost and say that's not too high a price, especially in light of what my Jesus did for me. He paid the penalty so all of humanity would have access to being in his presence in the Holy of Holies in heaven. But how few of us, only a remnant, say yes. And so last summer I was thinking, how many years do we get to live on the earth? Most of us only have nine decades, eight or nine decades at the most. That's not too much time to fully let God control my life to the uttermost. That's not much compared to the reward that lies before. It said that Jesus endured the cross because he looked toward the joy. We have a joy coming for us in this life and the next for those of us who are fully obedient to the Lord. Counting the cost. You know, speaking of counting the cost, I read this was a secular article. And the, the, right, the author of the article was saying, you know, we need to get over this notion that life can be easy. He said, life is just plain hard. We have to learn to navigate in the hard times and make the most of the times when it's not so hard. And so I thought, that's right. Life is never easy. Um, Dennis has talked about the suffering. Of course, Paul he was shipwrecked, he was stoned, he went through a lot of hardship while he was an apostle. And finally, he was martyred, but he never lost his joy. He maintained his joy and his sense of mission all the way through this. So yeah, he had some hardships, but you know what? They just had flooding in Texas. They have earthquakes. The earthquakes down in Mexico City. Life always has hardships. Nobody, even if they don't get in an earthquake or a flood, escapes hardships. It is part of life. So let's face it. There is suffering in life. There is tribulation in life on any level of the cross and for unsaved people. So, before we got saved, we were sinners suffering in our sin condition. And for a lot of us, it was our hardships that actually brought us to Jesus. Because we came to the point where we said, I can't do this. I need some help. Then, in the forgiven life, there is suffering in resisting temp temptation. You have to put forth a little effort to not just slide back into sin and losing what you have. Um, oh, on the forgiven level, suffering and trying to live the Christian life. I was just heartbroken when I learned I could still sin after being saved. <laughs> I really was. I really was. I thought I would be totally transformed. And uh, I actually had someone give me a prophetic word, return to me, I've covered your transgressions to get me to feel like I could even pray again. And then I learned, I looked around, I said, everybody's doing this. <laughs> you know, it's not just me there's something wrong with. There's something actually wrong with the whole human race. And the sooner we admit that, the better we'll be. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. <clears throat> so, in the replaced life, we suffer by resisting temptation 
sin and temptation, but we get stronger every step of the way. Remember, Paul prayed for believers, I travail in prayer that Jesus be formed in you. That there was a travailing he was doing. And you know what? I think his prayers are still ongoing today. I like to think that Paul's prayers toward believers are still go ongoing for us today. And we can receive his prayers. And then on the enthroned life level, there's the suffering because of what Jesus might ask you to do. He might ask you to do something that you consider embarrassing to get you so you don't mind what people think. In uh, Reese Howell's day, the um, I don't know who in many of you may have heard of Reese Howell's, um, the Lord, had, during that time, a man did not go outside without his hat on at all, period. Not if anybody else was around. Reese would, when he was walking, walking around outside and nobody was around, Reese would take his hat off because he was in an attitude of prayer as an honoring God. And God told him to stop wearing his hat. And he almost died of embarrassment. I mean, his own family, what are you doing? And then he was asked to go to London and he died a thousand deaths and his host died. This man is not wearing a hat. And then Reese explained to the man why he wasn't wearing a hat, but it was embarrassing for both of them. But you know, after a few weeks of living like that, it didn't bother Reese anymore because his obedience to God gave him the ability to rise above it. He died to having a hat on or not having a hat on. He died to what people would think of him because of his obedience to God. And so there's a suffering in that sense. And it might be a physical suffering. I think I mentioned in here that uh, Corey Ten Boom, after she was out of the concentration camp and went around speaking and saying, no matter how deep the pit, Jesus is deeper still. Yeah, yeah. And so she said, Jesus, I will go anywhere for you. And he said, I want you to go see your friend Elizabeth. And she said, well... She lives in the top of an apartment building, and that's 10 flights of stairs. And he said, I thought you said you'd go anywhere. So she suffered and climbed those 10 flights of stairs, maybe paused to get her breath as she went up. And then Paul suffered when he was shipwrecked. So there are hardships and suffering in life no matter what. Better to suffer from obedience to God and at least get a reward for it. You know, really, really, if you're going to suffer, something good might as well come of it, right? Right. So, so Jesus is our way. Everything God gives us, he gives us through his son. He is the stairway to heaven. Through Jesus, our spirit can, spirits can join. Through Jesus, our, he can take us to the spirit of his father. And it says in it says in, what is the scripture verse? I, uh, John 14, 23, He who keeps my commandments, I will love, and my Father will love, and we will come and make our home in Him. Come dwell in Him. When the Father dwells in us, he does the works. This is going to be the source of the signs, wonders, and miracles that shake a world into believing through the Father doing the works through us. The joy of partnering with God. Jesus said, I delight to do your will. He was in, ten, in Hebrews 10, 5 through 7. He quotes Psalm 48, which says, I delight to do your will, O oh my God, and your law is within my heart. That's a replaced life. When Jesus lives in us, the law of God is in us. We don't have to keep the law. He lives the law in us. In Hebrews 12, 2, for the joy that was for him, set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Did you know the most joyful books in the Bible are Paul's prison epistles? The most joyful books in the entire Bible. Go back and read Philippians. 
again. That was the joy that Paul was experiencing of life in the third level, even in prison. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. A man that we would think would need encouragement himself was busy writing letters of encouragement to other people because of the joy that was in him. In 1906, the Reese Howells that we talked about, in 1906, God offered Reese a chance to enter the third level or stay at low-level Christianity. And I want to go over the Bible words for um, the forgiven life or a placed life in the earth the enthroned life again. For the forgiven life, it's justification. Jesus' blood, by Jesus' blood, our sins are forgiven and we can have a relationship with God again. Sanctification, root word holiness, is the replaced life. When the Bible talks about being glorified, not speaking of our physical bodies being glorified, but living a level of being glorified internally is the enthroned life, the third level. So those are your Bible words for the three levels. But in 1906, God offered Reese a choice to enter the third level or stay at low-level Christianity. The Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, you have seen the position of the overcomers, but you haven't entered in. For years, you've been saying that you're not your own, that you wanted to give your life back to the Savior as completely as He gave His for you. And the Holy Spirit waited for an answer. Finally, the Holy Spirit said, are you willing to be made willing? And the enemy screamed in Reese's head, be careful, it's a trick. If you let him make you willing, you know you will be willing. And so finally, Reese said, Lord, I am willing. Having therefore boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, Hebrews 10, 19. No words can describe the little meeting in the house that night. The glory of God came down. See, it blessed not only Reese, but it blessed all around him. What we get, we can bless others with. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. It is impossible to describe the floods of joy that followed. We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. As the song that said, a thousand generations have gone before, and they're looking down to see what our response to this will be. Now, the key scripture summoning us from the second level to the third is Romans 12, 1, actually 1 and 2 together. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, looking back at all that's been revealed in the book of Romans until now, looking, looking at how good God was to graft us in and how good God is to know that he'll graft his people, the Jews, back in again. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God that I've just laid out for you previously, I beseech you to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And that word reasonable means reasonable. It's just logical. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind or mindset. Now, this can be taken in, take an individual, but in this case, it's really referring to stop looking at things in an earthly way. Leave off the earthly wisdom. Stop thinking that way and see what God has opened up and made possible for you. Just the fact that he's opened your understanding to be able to understand is amazing. And remember, if you see it, 
in the spirit, you can have it. Be transformed by the renewing of your mindset that you may prove. That means so you can experience, so you can approve it, so you can test, so you can be like a customs um, officer at the standing at the gateway to come into a nation and what can come in, what you say can come in, can come in, and what you say can't come in, can't come in. So we're standing as customs agents on this side of heaven, opening, approving, testing, opening the gates for God's glory to come on earth through us. We're opening the way between two realms, between two, two nations, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the earth, that you may prove what is the will of God that's good because everything God does, it's good. It's acceptable in the sense that a sacrifice is acceptable to God and pleases Him. And perfect will of God, amazing in its perfection, amazing in its love, amazing in its light, amazing in its glory. The will of God is a river of blessing poured out from heaven on earth. By the way, God loves so much that he gave Jesus for you. Through him, are you willing to love enough to give yourself that others might live? The believers on the third level are those who truly seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness but then not only do we get joy, but he becomes our source. Because he says, if you do this, all the things that are needed by you will be supplied by me. Matthew 6, 33. Because now you're drawing on the storehouses of heaven. The Holy Spirit doesn't come merely to fill us, but that from our fullness, others might be filled. Now, I know on the forgiven level on the, um, and on the second level, rivers of living water can flow out of us. But when we move to the third level, it's like a Niagara of living water flowing out from us to bless others and change the world around us. On the third level, we see life in terms of God fulfilling loving and saving purposes for others through us. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15, the love of Jesus compels us. It moves us to love others. And then it goes on and says, He died that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but live for Him who died for them and rose again. We are in union with our Father, the Eternal One. He is now in the process of completing what He has begun. We can partner with Him in the completing process, no longer as dependent children, but cooperating sons. I have a feeling that there are many in this place who are ready to take the stance of Romans 12, 1 and wait with us for the fire to fall upon our sacrifice. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.